Man, it's a spec. I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that you decided to come and to join us uh, via live stream on my show, Turn Up the Podcast. And uh, so you grew up in an evangelical space, right? Absolutely, yes. So, so do me a favor. Give give us your story. Tell us tell us a bit about where you come from. Tell us a bit about what you witnessed, what you saw, what it was like to be an evangelical. Um, it's clear. I talked to you, had a conversation with you. You are a Caucasian woman, right? Yes. And uh, you have some experience about about the evangelical church and the rhetoric and the things that that you've heard over the over the last I don't know how many years that you've been alive and been gracing this earth. So 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 give us a little bit of background about who you are and, and, and where you come from. Sure. So I was uh, born and raised in Hickory, North Carolina. So I am uh, was raised, you know, in the South, um, kind of in that Appalachian South area. And my father um, uh, was and still is a pastor. And so I, you know, was growing up in the South in a predominantly white um, area, um, in, raised in the church. And I was also homeschooled. And so I, I was really situated in a um, evangelical little bubble. And um, that had some um, positive effects and some negative effects on uh, my life and the way I thought about uh, myself and the world growing up. So I, um, I definitely was, was raised in a uh, hyper Christian space. Um, and I, um, I was raised, um, with certain beliefs that now I recognize are, are, um, uh, just slanted, you know, bias. Everybody in, in their environment growing up has certain biases that when you're a kid, you don't recognize that. And then as you grow up, though, as you become an adult, you start to realize um, the, the, those inconsistencies. So for me, as I became an adult, I um, began to notice how um, uh, patriarchal, how sexist, how um, white-centered and racist and xenophobic so much of evangelicalism is. And that's why I don't identify as, a, as an evangelical today, really, is because of um, me realizing as an adult the, the serious, serious flaws that are in, um, that are built into those evangelical spaces. So, so give me some so give me some examples because if I'm not mistaken, you said that you grew up in our conversation earlier. You said you grew up. If I'm not mistaken, you're from the South, right? Or you're, mm -hmm. was, yes. you're from the South, but you but you live in Kentucky now. Um, what was the environment like between churches that you come from and and African American churches? Like, was was there was there times where the two would come together did you see a lot of african americans in your places of worship how were they treated um and i know i heard you mention some sexism and things of that nature but, but what was that like growing up in the south so in in my kind of larger social sphere um i i did um uh see lots of of, of people of color of all um, of all varieties, but as kind of the circle narrows, as you add on, you know, the homeschool, the church, um, it kind of grows wider and wider. Um, and, um, so there, there were, um, uh, African-American people who I went to church with, who I consider to be friends, 
who uh, I loved and respected, but that was a minority um, uh, of the people. We also had um, a lot of um, Hispanic people in our congregation, people I loved and respected. Um, but again, the still, still a very white dominated space. Um, and so like within my uh, church movement specifically that I was a part of when I was growing up, um, a lot there, um, uh, I grew up in a conservative like Wesleyan holiness denomination. And so we had in, in the congregations in our area, we would have a lot of um, um, uh, fellowship together. Um, and in those situations, I would see a lot more uh, people of color and we would have a lot more uh, diverse worship experiences. Um, but our congregations remain honestly largely segregated. And that was a problem that leadership tried to address because that, that wasn't uh, an intentional choice necessarily, but rather just um, something that, that happened because of the way our, our structures were set up, which were not good. And so I did um, the, the, the racism that I saw growing up um, inside and outside of the church was like a very covert racism, a very, um, uh, a very passive racism. Um, to where, you know, no, nobody was standing up in the pulpit grabbing the mic saying, you know, I hate people of color or something like that. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that obvious. Um, and I think that's the way white supremacy works a lot of times, especially in the churches. It's very subtle, but it's there. You know, you said something, you said it's not, it's not so subtle. And that's the thing that I've been saying the last, for God knows how, I don't know how long. I feel like, and, and I might be kind of going, getting ahead of myself, but when I think about the last administration and I think about how a lot of people defended our last president, 45, 46 minus one, you know, or, or uh, uh, um, the son of a Klansman, as my sister Erica Savage off Roland Martin Unfiltered would call him. Um, you know, a lot of people, especially African-Americans, would defend him and say, well, he's not racist. And in my mind, I will always wonder, well, are you waiting for him to say Literally, I'm a racist, or are you? Because he's because they're never going to say it. Like you have to look exactly. for the, the social cues. You have to look for the signs. You have to look for the behavior. You have to look for the body language. You have to look for certain things that will suggest. For example, right? I don't know if you know how much about Crips and, and blood and things of that nature, but uh, a Crip would never tell you that they're a Crip because they're going to wear the blue colors. They're going to wear the bandana out their back pocket. A blood would never tell you that they're a blood because they're going to wear red. And then I'm just saying, just because I got on red, I ain't no crip. I'm just, I ain't no blood, <laughs> you know, but I'm just saying, so they're never going to tell you that, but you're going to know it in their behavior. You're going to know it in the kind of clothes they wear. It's going to be something about them that's going to suggest to you that they are a racist. And so for me, it was, that's how it's always been. Like it's the subtle things. And I think a lot of times people miss that. It's the subtle things that people miss because if you're going to wait for, for somebody like Donald Trump or whatever, Whatever, to say that I'm a racist, you're gonna be waiting for a long period of time. At the same time, you're gonna be not paying attention to the fact that they're trying to trying to build up that noose to put around your neck, whether it can be socially, spiritually, financially, economically, whatever. And so, and I think that that that's that's a big thing where you talked about um, the sub the subtle the subtle racism and, and the subtle behaviors. Um, but so so this is and it's crazy because when I think about the topic of our show. Uh, you know, the, the Trump effect, how Trumpism affected evangelicals, I find it very amazing because it's like the last four years, they have been just very vocal about their stance, their position. Like we already knew evangelicals, how they felt about same sex marriage and, you know, abortion and like those two main issues, you know, um, but it's like there was a lot of undertone the last four years that suggested other stuff and that suggested that there's, there's something more to this picture. There's something more that's going on here. And I guess, it, it, so we got a question in the chat, um, uh, minister, we got a, chat, a, chat, a question in the chat and this is from my wife. And so she says, uh, can you share a specific example 
Was it like the table conversations where certain things or jokes were made? Can you be more specific and think about a particular situation you can recall that was a manifestation of that type of white supremacy culture? So I know that was a lot, but I, if you got the gist of what she was asking. Yes. So <clears throat> I think that even in certain policy stances that evangelicals tend to take, they do not realize how uh, anti-black those stances are like when they reduce um, uh, uh, the need for for health care, for equitable access to health care. They don't realize just the the privilege that that statement is saturated in. And when um, they talk about how um, capital punishment is a right form of justice, they don't realize how anti-black that sentiment is because of the way the justice system is set up. And so a lot of, and I don't, I don't mean this um, to minimize the racism in the evangelical church, especially among white evangelicals, but so much is rooted in ignorance. Mm. And we have to own that. Uh, white people as a whole have to own that. And, you know, we can't use ignorance as an excuse. That is not a valid excuse. Um, but it is something that we have to admit, that we are so privileged that the things that we don't know we don't know are actively harming people. And so I think I think about a lot of those uh, type of um uh, you know, uneducated perspectives. Um, when I think about the the subtle racism in the evangelical church, mm. and I I I think that a lot of that is because we we have set up these white dominated spaces, and we don't have a lot of um, close community with people of color, and that is is by our own design as as white people um uh, you know i'm i'm reading um ibram x kendi's uh book stamped from the beginning right now and i am horrified <laughs> with each new page that i turn in that book and how deeply embedded um christianity is with white supremacy particularly uh in, in the formation of the united states of america and I don't think evangelical Christians um, in general are aware enough of that history to see how it still impacts us as a society to this day. You know, so my sister, Miracle Child, she said, I love this. And Sean, we love you too. We thank you for joining us. Uh, so it sounds like it's interesting because it sounds like... Um, Politics are integral in evangelical spaces and churches, right? And it sounds like it's a thing. And it's very interesting. My wife brought up something in the comment section. She said in the black church, sometimes we're taught to stay away from politics, right? Mm. Which is very interesting. But we've also, and it's interesting, so interesting because over the last four years, we have seen how political evangelicals have been involved in politics and involved yeah. in the political structure and have had a lot to say about politics, even down to the degree about the election, the results of the election. They have mixed their spirituality in with uh, politics as it relates to prophesying who's going to be the president, who's going to do this. And so it, it is just very interesting um, that you see the evangelical churches, how, you know, politics is a thing. It's accepted, you know, but in the black church, it's, it's like we kind of get depending on what church you go to because not every black church is like this but then some like to say that's a separation between church and state and then i had another show a couple of weeks ago i had minister rudy lee daniel on here who's a a colleague of mine in seminary school we went to howard university together and we talked about how um some some african-american preachers do not like to be involved in politics and don't see the mm -hmm. need, you know, and I've always said that Jesus was very political. Anytime you're talking about taking yeah. care of the poor and the least of these, that's a political issue that you have to address, right? And taking advantage of the poor. And so we've seen also in the word of God, plenty of times where, uh, when nations were destroyed or prophecy of being destroyed because of, of they were taking advantage of 
the poor, right? And so we see that behavior kind of here, even in America, right? A lot of things that's going yeah. on, you see those who need health care, who need food, who need, um, you know, social services and things of that nature. Like, that's taking care of the poor, in my opinion. And so, and I think it's, it's, it's just very interesting, the two worlds. And you talked about something, you talked about, excuse me, you talked about the... Um, I think you said it was two different churches where you where you came from, where it sounds like um, the African Americans kind of hung together. It sounds like, and then you had the, the Caucasians who hung together, and uh, you said that I think you said uh, your pastor tried to address it, um, but for some reason it, it just it, there was no resolve to it, and so it's interesting because it, to me. When I look at everything in totality, I look at the last four years and I look at a lot of evangelicals or evangelical Christians, preachers, or what have you. It's like they ignore that issue. They ignore the, the issue or the race issue, not just on a political level, but also in, in, the, in the Christian or church setting. Like, it, it's, it's just amazing to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, unfortunately, you know, because specifically in in the context that I grew up, you know, we had predominantly black churches uh, or black congregations and then predominantly white congregations, predominantly Hispanic congregations. So kind of uh, culturally, ethnically, everyone was kind of segregated, even though we all belonged to the same uh, a denomination and so when the and we kind of each had our separate um, uh, uh, governing boards within the state and so when, when the uh, predominantly white board said all right we need to all get together we need to get, have some unity here. We need to integrate our congregations. We need to uh, integrate our communities more. Um, uh, that, at least on, on paper, technically, that unity did occur. Yeah. But it, in, in reality, it, people are still very, very separate. And I think that's because that white people are so quick to call for unity and peace uh, and forgiveness, but without owning up to and without educating themselves on the ways that they have disparaged um, minority communities. Because our African-American congregations wouldn't have had to organize their own um uh, uh, governing committees had we been inclusive of them nor the Hispanic congregations mm -hmm. so if we had been inclusive from the beginning there would have been no um, need for us to, to have those separate origins mm -hmm. but we're not owning up to the fact that we created that that, that the, uh, the white um, dominated board had created that that um, that uh, lack of harmony in the community that was our fault, and we wanted to call for unity before owning up to our mistakes. And I think that that that's one of the things that frustrates me the most uh, in evangelical spaces today is when white pastors want to get up on stage and say, "We all need to come together. We need to be uh, uh, one body." You know, they they'll quote all of these scriptures. And like, that's true, we do need to come together. Um, but it is not the, the uh, place of white people whose race and religion has oppressed other people for centuries to call for that. Mm. I don't, I, when I'm the oppressor, I don't get to call for unity, mm. full stop. And I think that that's the mistake that a lot of white evangelical leaders make today is they want to rush to unity before making reparations, before educating themselves, before admitting where they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And that that's never going to um, create real lasting 
uh, unity and, and, and peace and inclusion in our communities. Mm. So, okay. So, so, so my question is this then, um, because you talked about, you, you talked about there being two separate churches, African Americans and then Caucasians. Um, and then, so we had a question here, right? So my wife said, this is an, at, so it, this isn't an atmosphere that Trump created for white evangelicals, but it's something that he just validated. Would you agree to that? Like, this is a culture that, that has been present the whole time. And this is something that Trump just validated. Like, this is not nothing new just because he came on the scene. Yeah. From my perspective, that is absolutely a hundred percent accurate. I think that Trump's rhetoric reinforced the uh, worldview that uh, conservative white evangelicals already had. That he he validated uh, a reality that said, um, you know, that 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 reinforced a white centered uh, existence <laughs> that said, well, we aren't racist. I don't hate brown people, you know, <laughs> like, uh, and and reinforce an idea of Christian superiority and entitlement, as well as an American superiority and entitlement, which kind of creates this super toxic conglomeration of Christian nationalism and Christianity being so deeply embedded with imperialism and colonization and capitalism, and reinforce this like fear of and contempt of anyone that can be labeled the other, whether that's because they're a different skin color than you, a different religion than you, uh, uh, were born in a different country than you, were born with more or less wealth than you. Um, so I, I think that when conservative white evangelicals heard this, they just got sucked into it. Um, and I, I, I think that that they so strongly supported Trump because he reinforced a, a worldview, a reality, a, a version of existence that they already believed in. Minister, I want to hopefully my, my video, my playback video is is, is um, playing well. It's going to play this video, uh, but I want to play something for you before I ask you this next question. So okay. here, here we go. Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement, angelic reinforcement. Uh -huh. Ha 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 ha. Angelic reinforcement. Pika hata anda ata ora bata rata anda ek ek manda. Ha! Rasata. For I hear the sound of victory. 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 Ha ha. Ha, 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 ha. What, what do you think that the president should rein in his language, uh, rein in his Twitter account a little bit, and think a little bit, a little bit more carefully before he tweets something? Rein himself in, do you think? Well, it depends. I, I, it's situational. Uh -huh. Ha, 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 ha. The Associated Press said that Joe Biden is president. Ha! <laughs> Evangelicals remain enthusiastically supportive of President Trump. Uh -huh. ha, 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 ha. Shannon, I know a lot of people are still perplexed. Why are Christians so supportive of Donald Trump? Ha! <laughs> well, it's really not that hard to figure out when you realize he is the most pro-life. Ha! <laughs> Pro-religious liberty. Ha! <laughs> pro-conservative judiciary in history, and that includes either Bush or Ronald Reagan. Uh -huh. Ha 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 The president, in defense of himself, he says no president has ever done what I have done for evangelicals or for religion itself. Ha 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 Unjustly, President Trump is not a racist. Ha Minister, I said you I saw you laughing because he said that Trump is not a racist and then the laugh. But listen, so so he, so here's a question that I have for you. In that video, I saw two African American preachers that come from the black church. Um, we saw one Pastor Daryl Scott, and the other one was um, Reverend Alveda King, who is the niece 
of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? Mm -hmm. That's A.D. King's daughter, uh, Reverend Dr. Avita King, who is a very known Trump supporter. Uh, and she loves Donald Trump with a passion. And uh, it's amazing because I've seen their behavior pre-Trump, the, the pre-Trump administration, during the Trump administration, and even post-Trump administration. I've seen their rhetoric. I've seen their level of support especially Dr. Alveda King, which I, it, it amazes me how you can be the niece of Dr. King and you can support somebody like Trump considering all that he stood for. Like that is just, it, it baffles my mind. And so, so here's the question that I have for you. Uh, what makes that space so conducive to Trumpism that it has drawn people of color? Like what is it about Trump that has drawn African-American preachers, you know, knowing that they come from a particular plight and struggle and fight what about this administration that has caused them to literally allow the administration to hijack their ministries the way that it has yeah i i think that a lot of it is is just indoctrination that is so white centered and so whitewashed that even though <laughs> Uh, in terms of American history um, uh, and broader Western history, even, uh, even though um, there is <laughs> most of the time um, white people have been the perpetrators of harm against marginalized groups, we have rewritten history to paint uh, ourselves the victors. And I think that that there is a lot of um, indoctrination tactics and manipulative tactics uh, employed by evangelicalism as a whole. And so when, when your pastor um, gets on stage and, and says, Donald Trump is not a racist, this is God's chosen man, your default is not to question that. Your default is to believe that because you've been indoctrinated to, uh, to accept that they are an inherently trustworthy person and that anything they say is essentially from the mouth of God, which is just dangerous uh, across the board on all levels. Um, but, but I really think that, um, that it does come from uh, uh, an, an indoctrinating perspective that people are largely coerced into believing this because then you have the social pressure. You know, if you find the most um, meaning and purpose and life out of those Christian spaces and everybody is telling you this one message, then to question that you, you, you jeopardize the thing you hold most precious. And so as, as a self-preservation tactic, you then just accept what people say and go and, and give in to that coercion because that, that pressure of vote like a Christian uh, that conservative evangelicals have is so strong. And I'll be completely honest with you. In 2016, when, when Donald Trump ran the first time, I voted for Trump yeah. because evangelicals told me that he was the only Christian option. And I believed them because I had been raised to accept what they say as true, to view them as credible sources on how to implement my faith. And I have regretted that every day since. But at the time that I did that, I, I really believed them when they said, if you're a real Christian, if you, um, if you truly want to, to bring God's kingdom here on earth, this is what you will do. This is who you will vote for. And that, that it, it's, it's dangerous to get caught up in because then I, um, became complicit in the, in all of the harm that he has perpetuated for these last 40 years. And I will forever be responsible mm. for that. 
And that's, that's hard to live with. But I have to admit that. I have to own that in order to create meaningful, meaningful change in my life first and then in my community. Mm. Mm. That, listen, that was tough just hearing that coming from you. You said something earlier um, while you were talking. You said that, um, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, that some um, white evangelical pastors would profess and proclaim and preach that Donald Trump is not a racist. And I find that synonymous and it makes me think about the denial that they would have about white supremacy and or the current existence of white supremacy. And um, they deny white supremacy, but they also struggle with Black Lives Matter, right? Why do some white evangelicals struggle with Black Lives Matter and then deny the presence of white supremacy? I think that's that's so tough. It's it's confusing to me how how you can hold, hold those beliefs. It, it doesn't make any sense to me either, because I, I totally agree that these white pastors who are saying Donald Trump's not a racist are the same pastors who say there's no such thing as white privilege. White supremacy isn't real. Uh, and all of those other just like blatantly wrong things. And so I don't, I, I, I don't understand. Um, and, and you see the pushback in, in evangelical communities of when people rightly say black lives matter you have the christian coming at the back door saying uh uh all lives matter mm -hmm. and <laughs> like that that is contradictory to 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 the point of saying black lives matter like uh, i i don't understand it i truly don't um it it because it does it defies logic it truly does mm -hmm. so so, so here, here's the thing January the 6th, we had an insurrection at the Capitol in which, as we speak, they're asking both the defense and the um, impeachment managers questions about, you know, they've already wrapped up their, their stuff, their, their arguments, defense, and the, and the prosecution. And in America, Donald Trump is on trial for being responsible for the insurrection. I would argue that he's not only the only one responsible for the insurrection and things getting as bad as it did and or that kind of behavior being spewed and accepted uh, massly in our country. But let me know if you agree with me. I partly blame evangelicals for that because they have the influence just like Trump has influence to tell their people to think a certain way, to vote a certain way, to believe a certain way, and to not use and exercise critical thinking skills and to make a decision or to do things based upon not only just what makes sense, but what is also spiritually and morally ethical. So I don't just blame Donald Trump for what happened. I also blame a lot of pastors, evangelical pastors, evangelical teachers who have been... Um, they must got good credit because they've been signing off, co-signing on his behavior, it seems like, you know. And so I, I also blame evangelicals in, in the spiritual realm, you know, in, 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 the, in the spiritual and religious arena because you have hundreds, thousands. I look at people like what we just saw. I can't, what's, what's the, the, the gentleman that was on that was laughing? Ha, 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 him. Uh, whatever his name is. Paula White, like you have listeners, you have people who believe in you. You have not just Caucasian people, but you have African Americans who vote against their own interests. I think, in my opinion, because if you vote for somebody like Donald Trump and you support somebody like Donald Trump, this is somebody who clearly does not care about the plight of African Americans. I don't care how you look about it. People argue all day long, talk about Joe Biden, the crime bill, in his defense. Hey, in his defense, actually, he has actually reconciled that by addressing it, apologizing, admitting the wrong for it, and then try to make efforts to change that and to do things and to make, and put legislation in place to change that. You know, and so, like I said, I don't know if you agree, but do you do you blame evangelicals along with Trump? Oh, wholeheartedly. 
I, I absolutely do. I mean, they, they erected a huge cross at, at, at the insurrection. And so I think, I think that um, was a very clear sign of how Christian nationalism is deeply tied into this support of Trump. And I, you know, I've seen the, the, the memes circulating on the internet that when I see them, I view them as a joke, but some people genuinely believe them when they're, t uh, they're like um, reference uh, or they're, they're comparing Trump to, to Jesus and trying to like equate them or when they're saying like, like, you know, have a, a little quoted prayer, God, please protect President Trump. He's doing your work. <laughs> like, just, just these absolutely outlandish statements. See. And it's wild. It, it's see, messed up. See, see here, here's, here's the thing for me, right? What you just said, evangelicals have said that Trump is God's man. He's a man of God and all this other kind of stuff. First of all, how can he be a man of God if he doesn't even believe in repentance? He doesn't even believe that there's a need for him to repent because he functions in a place of arrogance and pride. Things that the Lord thy God does not like. So how can you put him up there as God's man, as a man of God? It's, it's almost blasphemy for me in, in a slap in the face as a fellow preacher myself. Right, who understands that we all have fall fallen uh, short of the glory, come come short of the glory of God, right? And we all are born in sin and iniquity. And for a man to profess who will hold the Bible upside down and say, you know, I don't believe, I, I don't believe I need to go to God. And he said this himself. He doesn't believe that he needs to go to God and ask for repentance for anything. And so it's that kind of behavior. It's that kind of thinking. It's that kind of mindset that to me, I have challenges with those such statements to say that he's a man of God. You know, it's, it's fine. It's wonderful. You know, you make mistakes, right? We all make mistakes. But it's how you pick yourself up and it's how you reconcile once you fall short. Right. And a lot of people love to say when they find themselves caught in scandals, they love to go to David and say, well, David, you know, slept with Bathsheba. Yeah, but David may have did that. And David may have killed a, a, a woman's husband just to get her. But David also lived a life of repentance. David also turned his face yeah. unto God and said, God, you know, save my child. But nevertheless, his child had to die because of his behavior. And not only did his child die because of his behavior, he understood that concept and he accepted that, hey, this is the consequence that I have to pay because I stepped out of the will of God. But nonetheless, after the child died, he got up off his knees. He stopped mourning and he went on because he understood you know, he understood to every every action there's an equal and opposite reaction or what have you. And there's a consequence to what you do, whether it's good or bad. And so while David was an adulterer, while David was also a murderer, all in one situation, he also was remorseful and lived a life of repentance after the prophet came to him and told him about himself. And he didn't try to kill the prophet, but he said, you know what, man, what, what did I, like, I done messed up. I done did some crazy stuff. Like, wow, this is me that you're talking about. And so, yes. I'm living a life of repentance. And see, you can't claim the, the spirit of David if you ain't going to really function like David, man. And, and, that, and that's just in my humble opinion. You know, yes, David was, was flawed, but he was also chosen and he also lived a life of repentance. And uh, so, so there was a lot of things that I've struggled with the last four years with evangelicals. And this is, in, in, in Minister Chloe, this is how I view a lot of white evangelicals. Once a year... On February the 2nd, up there in Pennsylvania, they have something called Groundhog Day. That once a year, this groundhog makes his grand entrance and will tell you or prophesy whether you're going to have a, long, a longer winter or early spring. And then after that little moment, the groundhog goes back in his little hole until next year. And that's kind of how I feel about evangelicals. They've been hiding all this time, hiding their racism suddenly all this time, 
until when Groundhog Day came at the beginning of the Trump administration, they came out before the world and started saying all of their rhetoric and saying all of their craziness, right? And now that the Trump administration is, is, is gone out the picture, now I feel like they're slowly but surely taking all that racism and going back into the groundhog hole, going back under the under the mold, under the hole with all that stuff. And so, it, it, and that's just amazing to me because I'm like, where's Paula White at now? You know, mm -hmm. where, 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 where's, where's his name? Franklin Graham, what's his name? Uh, uh, Sir, Sir Laugh a Lot. Him. You know, where, like, where are all these preachers at that had all this rhetoric that was going live and was streaming and doing all these things and prophesying, false prophesying? About all this kind of stuff, you know, and, and, and it's a slap in the face because as a man of God, like, it's bad enough Christianity is already tainted in the eyes of a lot of people who don't even want to come to church. And so when you see stuff like this, mm -hmm. when you hear stuff like this, it makes it harder for us to get the gospel, to, to, to get people to a place to where they can accept the gospel. So I'm not just having issues about Trump having an influence on evangelicals but he's had so much of an influence to where he's gotten people to lie on their spirituality on their walk with god and and that, and that is so dangerous it, it is it is so dangerous and i think that um the last four years so the the relationship between um the black church and evangelicals is already tainted in, in many different ways, shape, or form. We, we see that in history. Uh, but I think the last four years has really put a strain on the relationship between the black church and, and evangelicals and how we deal with them. You know, and, and like you said, you have, you've, you've borne witness to African Americans in, in your church when you grew up and you saw how the relationship was between the two groups of people, you know, and then as somebody who comes from the white evangelical church, I want to ask you this question. Um, is it possible for evangelicals to reconcile with uh, their black brothers and sisters in Christ after this, after post-Trump? Um, you know, it, it, is it possible to reconcile? And or what does that look like? Like, what, what, do, what, does, that, what does reconciliation look like between evangelicals or white evangelicals to be more specific in and their black African American brothers and sisters in the faith. Yeah, I, I I want to believe that it is possible. I want to believe that that is something that uh, can and will happen, and I I I have faith that it can happen if um, if evangelicals can can you know reverse their their posture. Um, because I think I think that evangelicals underestimate how much work they will need to do to um, to to address the systemic harm that they have perpetuated. Because you know, some evangelical responses to Trump are like you know pro-Trump, he's God's gift, whatever. But then other evangelical Christians will say. Uh, are you are y'all crazy? Like he's not God's gift. He he he's not God's man. This is Satan's work. He's this isn't real Christianity, which I think is also wrong on a level, because that's deflecting um, the responsibility that that white people and white Christians have uh, in this system. This. Why, why evangelicals must accept that this is a world of our making. There is no boogeyman. We have <laughs> created the systemic injustices that, that, that exist in our country today and in our churches today. Like, you, we, we have to own up to that. And so when I think about what, what, what the appropriate evangelical response to those white evangelicals who are like, this is so wrong. We, we have to change the way that we're living. I think first and foremost, white evangelicals have got to stop talking. Like, <laughs> stop talking. I feel like every, every <laughs> time I see a, a, a white pastor get up on stage and say something so ignorant about 
uh, race in America. I, I just feel it's like it's like watching watching uh, a car wreck, and you're like, oh my gosh, just stop, just stop. You're making it so much worse. Please, just shut up. Uh, and it, it, it's terrible because even our uh, our least controversial um, uh, 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 white evangelical leaders say the dumbest things. <laughs> like I, I, I remember when when Louis Giglio when he uh, uh, was having that conversation last summer with the Chick Fil A guy and and Lecrae, and he just in a moment of utter stupidity. And it's just so deeply steeped in his white privilege, uh, tried to say that that um, slavery in the U.S. was a, in his words, a blessing. And he tried to backtrack that and apologize for that later, and it just utterly fell short. But I'm like, dude, you are so your 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 ignorance and your privilege is so deeply ingrained in you you don't even know when you're messing up in real time and so you just gotta stop talking like and i mean this for myself too we've got to stop centering ourselves and thinking that we alone are going to fix this problem and i I think that white evangelicals are going to have to actively engage in, in a cycle of education and lament. Um, we need to learn what we have done wrong. We need to learn about the oppression that we are complicit in to this day and mourn for that. And, and, um, uh, and, you know, work, work through that lament, um, on an emotional level and a spiritual level and you know stop calling for peace and unity prematurely uh and we need to defer leadership to uh to people of color because we we cannot um you know i i i think of uh the saying um you know you cannot um uh, use the the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. Yes. We cannot, why evangelicals, we cannot use the, the tools that have been profoundly shaped by white supremacy to dismantle white supremacy. That's not how it works. Mm. And so we need to turn over uh, uh, leadership and, and, and defer to the voices of our um, faith leaders of color to mm. say, you know, uh, to, to provide um, a direction for, for where to go next and how to begin making those reparations um, so that we don't perpetuate more harm in our, in our however well-intentioned, um, you know, efforts to, to do better. We, uh, why evangelicals have to accept that we are still very, very capable uh, uh, of, of perpetuating harm without knowing it. And so we've got to take a step back from leadership. That, that's, that's, that's a lot, but, but I think that's, that's also part of the problem. Like this, right. why evangelicals must accept that this is not going to change in a day. You know, preaching one sermon series, doing one Bible study is not going to dismantle white supremacy in our congregations, in our communities, and in our country. Hiring one person of color uh, on, on our pastoral staff will not dismantle white supremacy. Uh, th th that's not how it works. We have got to settle in to long-term plans for uh, for creating an, uh, an anti-racist culture in our churches and larger communities and, and in this country. Right. That, that is so, that is so amazing. That is so amazing. And see, this is, this, this is, this is what my show is all about. This is what my podcast is all about. Like I don't, I don't come on air just to talk just cause I got free time. I come on air to empower my people. I come on to uplift my people, to bring them information, to give you real stories, 
and to give you nothing but truth because this is what we need particularly in times like this right i give you this, this, this is this is why i put this together to bring people like minister chloe here to talk and to, and to share their stories because hey prior to minister chloe coming you know and talking on my show Somebody and truth be told, I like having real conversations. Somebody could have thought that all white people were devils, you know, or evil or, or all the same. That's like saying all black people are the same, all black people, you know, love chicken and, and things like that. Like, like I'm all about diversity. I'm all about bringing people here that will that would that are will that are willing to share their truth, willing to tell this is what it is. This is what's been happening. This is what they're saying. And this is what you need to look out for. And this is how you need to govern yourselves because this stuff is real. And so, Minister Chloe, I thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come and, and to sit online, you know, on, on my podcast to talk with me about a subject that is that is necessary to talk about. Because the reality is we all have our own opinions and, and, and feelings and thoughts behind closed doors. But at what point do we come to the table, whether it be, you know, white Christians, black Christians, Asian Christians, to bring all of our gripes to the table and say, these are the issues that we have. This is what's crippling us. This is why we can't go forward because we have our issues amongst ourselves. And hey, sometimes, I don't know about you, but every now and again, I like to have a family meeting in my house. And so we need to have a family meeting amongst Christians and say, hey, black church evangelicals, it's a history between y'all two. And that's something we're going to talk about on Monday with my other guest that's coming on the show on Monday. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on the, the history of the black church and how it derived, right? And so... Um, Honestly, Minister Chloe, this just kind of started or spearheaded that conversation, and I think it's very necessary. And so I do want to tell you personally, I thank God for your life. I thank God for your truth. I thank God for your ministry. I thank God for you finding it not robbery to come here to a predominantly African-American show to speak your truth and to talk your stuff, as they would say in the, in the, in the street, talk your stuff, right? And so, um, you know, I, I, I pray nothing but God's best for you. Keep on spreading that truth. Keep on loving on your African-American brothers and sisters and people of color because we need to see that. We need to know that, hey, we're not in this alone by ourselves, right? And even, watch this, even, and I think we talked about this before we went on the air, even back in the day, back in the 60s, when Dr. King was fighting on the front line and marching in, 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 in Selma and in Birmingham and in, in, in Montgomery, you had Jews, you had Caucasian Christians who were on the front lines with him that was sharing, empathizing with his plight, empathizing with the plight of people of color. And just like he had people uh, of Caucasian descent and, and Jews and, 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 and uh, you know, people like that, right? We also have people in the person of Minister Chloe Speck who are also on the front lines with us that are willing to share our plight, that are that are willing to tell their stories, that are willing to get the bricks thrown at them, you know, just like just like we getting the bricks thrown at us. Like and so I appreciate you for that and I appreciate you for that. Any final words before I before we close out the show? I just want to thank you so much, Deontay, for inviting me on your show it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you this evening and so i i just thank you for letting me be here thank you thank you thank you listen we got let's see let's listen uh, uh minister joyce duncan she said great platform deontay i have to talk to my 12 year old granddaughter she has a fear of white people because of what's been going on in our nation great conversation mm -hmm. well elder joyce duncan do me a favor i want you to share uh, tonight's episode with your granddaughter. I'm going to put it up on YouTube. Uh, but before I share my stuff, I want y'all to follow follow Minister Chloe uh, Speck on 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 her platforms. All right, she's on Twitter right there at Chloe J Speck. All right, she's on Twitter. She also uh, has a Facebook account. All right, y'all go follow her at Chloe J Speck right there on Facebook. And also, she's also on Instagram. The sister is everywhere. Chloe J Speck. Uh, on Instagram, and she gave me her email at Chloe J Speck at iCloud. So if y'all got questions, y'all want to hit her up, y'all want to hear more of her stories. And uh, Chloe, I'm gonna tell you this, Miss Chloe, this ain't gonna be the last time you be on my show because it's gonna be some other crazy stuff. We might gotta come back and talk about this uh, impeachment trial, you know, and, and talk about this and, and, yes. and to really, I mean, it's some stuff that we gonna have to talk about, you know. Anyway, as time goes on, but Minister Chloe, I want you to stay put. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you, so don't hang up, don't go nowhere. I'm gonna close up my show and talk. 
talk to you in a little bit. Uh, so stay put. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank uh, Minister Chloe Speck for coming on the show tonight and talking to us about uh, the Trump effect, how Trumpism has affected evangelicals. And listen, we're going to pick up this conversation on another spectrum on Monday. So watch this, y'all. So on, so I got a couple of shows already lined up for um, the remaining a part of February. And I want to uh, give a shout out to my wife, Lamika Carroll, because uh, we got a newborn baby and she's allowing me to do this show on Monday night. Because uh, normally my show is once a, once a week, but I think it's, the Lord has really been pulling and tugging that I need to do this follow-up show. Uh, so watch this. I got a couple of shows coming up, so I want y'all to look at this. All right, so Monday night, so look at Monday night. Monday night, I have uh, Pastor Reverend Melick E.M. Thomas, Pastor of Bethel AME Church, and I have Reverend Jasmine Brooks, Pastor of Macedonia AME Church. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit more, but on a deeper level. We're going to be talking about the black church and evangelicals. Where do we go from here? And we're going to be talking about the history of the black church, how the black church started, which really started with the AME church and it derived out of the Methodist church. So we're going to be delving into the history of the black church. We're going to be talking about uh, the ins and outs of the black church and, and how they dealt with uh, um, racism and, and prejudice and white supremacy and, and really talking about on a deeper level from the lens of the African-American community community in the black church uh pre-trump during trump and the post-trump administration and this is something that you don't want to miss and uh, uh i'll tell you this reverend reverend thomas and reverend books they are they are some powerful young pastors in the AME church you don't want to miss that also watch this also on february the 19th uh friday february the 19th navigating love and spirituality i'm going to be talking to danelle and uh tanaj uh, brown and they're going to be sharing their story uh, about how they met. Um, they, they're trying to navigate their their relationship, getting married, being married, and spirituality, and dealing with church folk, y'all. Also, watch this. I just added this one, and I'm excited because I have, on the very last Friday of February the 26th, 2021, I've got a show that I'm going to be doing with none other than my sister, Minister Nikita Campbell. Uh, that show is going to be called A Rich Gospel, But Broke Christians. God Won't Fix Your Credit. And so we're going to be talking about um, uh, spiritual accountability with your finances um, and, and dealing with your finances and how Christians can really uh, properly manage their, fa their finances with integrity. It's no need of being blessed and you don't know how to manage your blessings financially. So we got a lot of hot shows coming up, y'all. A lot of hot topics and some wonderful guests coming up. Listen, do me a favor. Like tag share and subscribe to the channel i ain't coming here to play no games with y'all i ain't coming here to play podcast i ain't coming here to play radio i came to talk about some real stuff that's going to empower my people so y'all do me a favor follow me at deontay j Kerr on twitter there it is right there the lower third at the bottom i'm also on facebook follow me at deontay j Kerr senior also i'm on instagram i'm everywhere y'all all right follow me at deontay curl one word no apostrophe and lastly this is what you also want to do right if you're not friends with me on facebook and for some reason you can't see the broadcast live on facebook live this is what i do i post all of my episodes i post everything on uh, my facebook page on my, my my youtube page i post everything there and uh go go add my youtube page at deontay curl right there you see the lower third and uh uh, uh, follow me and subscribe like share and subscribe to my channel like share and subscribe go right now i'm talking I'm talking to you right now go to youtube type my name in deontay curl you see it right there ain't no excuses all right ain't no excuses why you can't have this information go and subscribe to my channel go and, and click that bell so that way anytime i post some some new videos or some or some new things you will get the notifications y'all and so until next time y'all i love you guys until next time keep that volume turned up minister chloe stay put i'm gonna close this show out stay put
Hey, 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 what's happening? This is Deontay Carroll, host of Turn Up the Volume Podcast. And listen, I want to let y'all know something. You can follow us on many different platforms. You can follow me on Facebook at Deontay J. Carroll Senior. You can also follow me on Twitter at Deontay J. Carroll. No apostrophe. Also, I'm on Instagram at Deontay Carroll, or one word, no apostrophe. And lastly, you want to follow me on YouTube at Deontay Carroll because I post all of my episodes and post all of my shows from the podcast on my YouTube page. So if you want to continue to stay connected, make sure you like, share, and subscribe and follow me on all of my social media platforms. And remember, until next time, keep that volume turned up. Peace. Be blessed.